Sure, it's great to have a phone full of photos of friends and family, but wouldn't it be better to get them out of the phone and onto some place where you can enjoy them, like on a bangle bracelet around your wrist? In today's video, I'm going to show you how to do just that. Hey there, Sandy here. Welcome to another jewelry making video at keepsakecrafts.net. So the folks at Resin Obsession sent me a couple of their bangle bracelet molds. I'll have all the information for which molds these are. This is their chunky bangle mold and this is their bangle bracelet mold. If you go onto their website, they'll have all of the information for the inside diameters of these and you can compare them with the inside diameter of bracelets that you know will fit so that you can get the size you want. But these work perfectly for me and I have an average size wrist about a 7-ish. So I went through my phone and I pulled out a bunch of photos of family and one of pets that I thought would be fun just to keep with me forever. Now I'm not going to go into all the details of how I got them this size. So if you want a tutorial on using Photoshop, that's what I used to do this. I can explain how I did it, but there are lots of programs out there, Canva and such. There are free software programs out there that I'm sure can help you do this. I wasn't really thrilled with the colors here, so I did it again. I just lightened them a little, then increased the contrast and made them all sepia, because I think that will just be a lot more attractive on my bracelet. I made all of mine landscape, but you could definitely have them going portrait if you want them to go sideways around your bracelet. And I will show you what I mean, because I'm basing this whole project on using this stuff. Stuff. It's film strip ribbon. It's from Tim Holtz, and it's really cool. It's a plastic strip about five-eighths of an inch wide that has that looks like old time film and so I have sized my photos so that each one will fit inside one of these frames. So the first thing you'll want to do is figure out how much of this ribbon you will need to go into your mold. I've already done that. It just takes some trial and error. I decided I wanted this to be floating in the middle. I thought it would just look really cool to have this right in the middle of this big chunky bangle bracelet. So I figured out how much would fit and it's 14 frames, which is why I chose seven different photos. And there's a little bit of overlap here just to get it perfectly centered. And what's great about this is this is going to hold your photos exactly where you want them in the resin. So as long as you put it in here, you know, centered of course and not off kilter, it's going to hold them exactly where they, you want them to be. You could do the same thing in this mold. You wouldn't have as much room for the ribbon to float, but it is the same depth. I'm going to untape this. I just used scotch tape and I'm going to use packing tape because it's a little bit more clear. The scotch tape I have is frosted, so I'm going to use packing tape for my photos because what you need to do is seal your photos before you put them in the resin so the resin doesn't seep in and ruin them. I'm going to use two photos because if you think about it, if you're looking at one of these bracelets, it's clear, you see both sides. Maybe not so much if you're wearing it, but I really didn't want to have the blank white on the back or even like this shadow here. So I'm going to double side my photos. I'll show you what I mean. Over the course of making the bracelet with the sepia photos, I figured out some things and some better ways of doing things. So I made another bracelet using these flower photos. Some of the clips will show me working with the sepia photos and some of the clips will show me working with the flower photos in color. I'll be using a different size mold, but those are the only differences. The techniques are exactly the same. You can certainly use scissors to cut out your photos, but I figured out a better way of cutting them out so you can line them up accurately and that is to use a paper trimmer. Here's a sheet that I already started cutting so you can just put your paper in here and trim along the top and bottom edge of each of your strips of photos. 
Then turn it and what you want to do is cut on one edge and you'll just have to kind of line those up. So there's one edge. So we've got all those little bits. Then cut on another edge one photo over. So I'm going to leave this white space in between these and cut. So if I cut on the left edge here, I'm going to cut on the right edge one photo over. So you'll do them all, of course. I just did a few. What you'll have are these little strips like this with two identical photos with a white strip in between and it doesn't matter what size that is. Next use a glue stick. Add glue to the back of one of them. Then you can meet up those cut edges and it should be perfectly lined up top to bottom and it, it might be a little bit off on the ends, but it won't be too much. So if you see here's this one's wider, or this one side is a little wider, that white bit that's showing. So I'll cut on this side. And if you need to do a little bit more trimming, you can. But there, now that's perfectly lined up. So you repeat to cut out all of your photos. For this bracelet, with the sepia photos, I did seven. For this one, I decided to fill up my film strip of 14 frames, and I did 14. Here are my 14 photos cut out, and now what I'm going to do is glue them to the inside of my film strip. This will do a couple things. First of all, because I'm using color photos, and this film strip has a little bit of a yellowish brown tint, it will actually help the photos all sort of work together and be a similar tone. Also, because it curls to the inside, it's going to be shaped. There's a chance if we put them on the outside, they would be more prone to popping off the tape because it's kind of stretching them. So I just have some scrap paper here and I'll add a little glue stick and line them up. And add as many as you like to your film strip. For the sepia photos, I just added one in every other one of these frames. But for these photos, I'm going to add one to every frame. And interestingly, the, um, the film strip ribbon, actually, I have the same amount of frames, whether it's the chunky bangle or this one. I could have made this a little tighter and had one less but it, it works out fine to have 14 just like with the chunky bangle. So there, I have all of my photos on and what we need to do is seal the entire thing in packing tape. You don't want the resin to be able to get at the paper because it will wreck it. It will so soak into it, darken it, change it. Also, this film strip ribbon, I don't know if you can tell on camera, it has little perforations like a real film strip reel would have. And these are ideal places for air bubbles to form and lurk in our resin. So sealing it with packing tape will be a great solution. So what I need to do is cut a piece of packing tape a little bit longer than my ribbon because I want to be able to cut off the jagged ends that are from this little perforation that tears it. And that looks good. I'm just going to put that sticky side up on my tile. I'm going to put my ribbon just slightly overlapping one edge. Press that down. I'm going to cut this off flush at that end. And with this end, try not to get fingerprints in it. And then just pick it up and fold it over. Give that a good press. And I'll do one more fold. 
you can burnish out if, you know, if there's any ripples. Try not to. Like I've got one here, but I can burnish that out just with my fingernail. Then carefully trim that little bit of extra packing tape off. And this leaves your film strip ribbon and your photos completely encased and protected from the resin. Be careful you don't cut your fold of your tape. Just cut that excess bit off. It's okay if you leave a little bit of extra. It's better to cheat it to the outside of the, um, of the fold. You just don't want to cut off your fold, otherwise your ribbon won't be protected from the resin. Now we can put this into our mold and determine where your overlap is going to be. Get yourself another piece of packing tape. And I want to cut it a little bit wider than my overlap. And I'm going to put that overlap on the inside. Place this down on the tape. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. I'm just going to put this right there. And then bring that tape up and around to seal that in completely. And if you have any excess, go ahead and trim that off. Now you can place that inside your mold and add your resin. The next thing you'll want to do is determine how much resin you need. Now if you're using these exact molds, I already did that for you. But a trick for doing that, if for a different mold, is simply to fill it with water. Measure how much water it will take, and then you'll know how much resin you need to mix up. This one, the chunky bangle mold, needs 60 milliliters, about two ounces of water. And this one, the bangle mold, needs about 30 milliliters, or around an ounce of, not water, resin. And please, please, please make sure that you dry your mold out thoroughly and clean it really well before you go pouring resin into it because resin does not like water. So now it's time to mix up some resin and it's kind of handy that this works out to a e number evenly divisible by three because this resin is a little bit different than some you may have seen. You need two parts of A to one part of B. So whatever measurement you get for your mold, just divide it by three. So in this case it's 60 milliliters divided by three. I need 20 milliliters of B and then I need two times that or 40 milliliters of A and that will give me my 60 which should fill up my mold perfectly. So be sure to follow the directions on here, the mixing time, work in a well ventilated place and all of that. So I've got my bangle mold with my inclusion, the film strip ribbon with the photos. I've got that placed on a tray that's lined with wax paper because it's hard to be neat with resin, and I'm not neat in the best of days, so just protect your work area with some wax paper. I've got my 60 milliliters of resin all mixed, mixed for two minutes, and I love this stuff. It's been sitting for a moment, not long since I finished mixing, and the bubbles are practically gone. This is a casting resin. It won't dome, and it's a much thinner viscosity than some of the resins that you might have tried to work with. If you work with magic gloss, like a UV, UV resin, it, it's much thicker. This is thin and very few bubbles, which I think is awesome. Now most of the time they suggest uh, to dip things that you're going to put in the cast into the resin before pouring resin over it but I'm not sure how to do this without making an utter mess. So I'm going to just start pouring around it. Oh, well, that's interesting. So as I pour on the inside, it's moving. So I'll have to get it kind of filled up. And then I should be able to adjust it. 
I can lift that up a little. There we go. Lift that up and let the resin flow underneath. So you'll kind of have to pay attention to that. That you've got that film strip that's blocking the bottom. But then as it gets to the top, it should kind of all even out. That's looking pretty even. I've definitely got a bit of an overpour, and it looks like my work table is not level, so I'll have to adjust that before I go off and leave it to cure. And that was a pretty good estimate of the um, the amount. I don't know if you can see, there's just a tiny bit left in here. I mean, this top edge will have to be cleaned up anyways. After molding, it tends to get concave and has rough edges, so it often needs to be sanded. So I'm not real worried about it, about it right now. There we go. That's level. Yes. And we'll just come in with a lighter. I love doing this part. Pop any air bubbles. And pull out any hairs. <laughs> <laughs> so look your piece over carefully before you go off and leave it. The thing about resin is that once it's cured, there's like there's, there are a few things you can do. If you've got holes in the surface, you can often drill and then fill those in with resin. But it's kind of what's in there is what's in there, and there isn't a ton of opportunity to repair. So what you really have to do is take great care and look your piece over carefully before you leave it to cure. Once you're happy that your piece is good and you're ready to leave it, then find something to cover it with. I just have a, a, a container, a plastic container that I'm going to cover it with to protect it from dust and hairs and things that are floating in the air landing on it while it's curing. I have lots of people to thank for the making of this video. First of all, I want to thank the nice folks at Resin Obsession for sending along to me their resin and the two bangle bracelet molds. Also, I want to thank my patrons who make these videos possible. Without patrons, I don't know that I would be making videos on YouTube. So thank you all so much. If you like my videos and you watch them every week when I upload, you might consider becoming a patron. Not only do you enable me to keep making these YouTube videos for free for everyone, but I also make bonus tutorials for my patrons. You can get up to two every month. You can learn more about it at patreon.com slash the Resin Obsession 2-Part Resin takes 12 hours to cure, so here we are 12 hours later. This is, of course, not the one you saw me pour, but I'll show you that one. One thing I noticed when I did this one a little bit differently with the packing tape is that the film strip wanted to float up in the resin and not sit right up against the this bottom, which will kind of now be the top. So I took some scotch tape and just put a few pieces across it and it does come off the cured resin. Now I noticed I kept filling in these holes because the tape on the inside, because it's smaller so it puckered out, and I kept filling them in and filling them in with resin and yet they still opened up on me. So that's probably something I'm going to have to go in and pour, add some more. So as a result of the tape and everything, this bottom edge is pretty messy, but we can fix that. So it's actually kind of counterintuitive how you demold these. First you want to press in the center, press down, and then press up. And you may be able to see, it's not doing it so much, a little bit you'll see the color change. It'll get lighter, which means the resin is pulling away from the mold. And then here you might think you want to do this, but actually, can you see that as I do this? Where it's just, you can see it getting lighter and pulling away from the mold. And you just kind of work your way around and around and around. You just keep going around. You won't get it all on the first pass. 
the chunky bracelet took a little bit longer than this one. I had to go around maybe four or five times before it released completely. Most of the time when your pieces come out of the mold they are not going to be ready to wear. You're going to have to do some cleanup. It's just the nature of resin. And we're getting there. So that's all released and oh, it looks like I need to do a little more releasing on the inside. I also over poured quite a bit here because the film strip with the packing tape on it took up a fair amount of space in this mold. So my 30 milliliters would have been perfect to fill this if it were empty, but it was too much with that film strip in there. So I, I you might want to set aside just a couple pieces that you want to fill. You can color them or something, but use your leftover resin so it doesn't go to waste. One thing you don't want to do is use something sharp in here to try to pry it out. It'll damage your mold, it'll possibly damage your resin piece. Just a little bit of patience. You can see it's starting to come up now. And one thing I noticed about these two bangle bracelet molds is that the edges are not perfectly straight. They're a little bit at an angle, which probably makes getting them out of the mold a bit easier. Patience. Just keep working your way around. Oh, almost there. There we go. Oh, that's cool. I like that. What you can do for these big chunks is actually just come in with a pair of scissors and cut them off. You can also go around carefully with an X-Acto knife to clean up these sharp edges. You know, these photos are tiny, but it only takes a glance at them, and I remember where they were taken, when they were taken, what the circumstances are, and they just bring back the memories and a smile, and isn't that what memory jewelry is about? Now here's the one that I started with using photos of my family, and this is a lot of fun, but you know, I think I would have liked it better if I had filled every frame with the pictures, but that's okay. This one I have sanded and buffed, so all of these edges, this is the edge where I poured it in, and you can see something similar happened here. I thought I was going to keep that from happening with this. What, ha what I did with these photos was I took a piece of tape about in a quarter of an inch bigger all around than the photos and used those to stick my photos down to the film strip, to the back side, burnished it really well. But you can see from this top view here how the tape started to lift off of the film strip. It didn't stick really well. So they look all right from here. So it's just this top view, or the bottom view, both, where you can kind of see what's going on. And the same with this. Actually, it's kind of worse. <laughs> um, I thought that I would combat that problem by wrapping the entire thing in a piece of tape, but that didn't seem to solve that. And in fact, some of these these are voids that I will have to fill. So what I'll do is get this all cleaned up nicely and then I will fill this with UV resin, like magic gloss, and have a dome. In fact, I might do that on this one as well. This one has been sanded and buffed. I went through all, all the grits. I started at 400 wet dry sandpaper. 600, 800, 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000. And then I buffed it with Flitz Polish. And those things will all be listed down below in the description box. I'll have a list with links to those products. So I sanded all four faces, sanded and buffed, the inside, the outside, this one, and this one. And it feels really nice. It's, it's nice to, to wear. It feels nice. I, I love that it's just chunky. I think it's very cool. If you don't feel like sanding and buffing, and hey, when do we? I'll link to an article by Resin Obsession that 
has several alternate ways of getting a shiny finish on your resin. You can see straight out of the mold it's a little dull, it isn't shiny, so it definitely needs something if you want that shiny resin. Here's the bracelet all cleaned up. It's looking a lot better than when you last saw it. It's not perfect. So the first thing I did was I sanded that top portion where the resin was poured in that was so rough. I actually started with 60 grit sandpaper, really aggressive, because it was just quite a mess. So I went from 60 to 100, 150, 220, 320, and then I went from through four, six, eight, and a thousand. I read that somewhere, I can't remember where, but they said if you're going to put another coat of resin on top to sand to at least a thousand so none of the scratches show through the resin. Once I got that sanded down, then I took my UV resin and I filled in these voids, which still kind of show, unfortunately. Cured that in my UV lamp, and then I domed it over that. And then to make the outside shiny, I tried something different. I used a clear acrylic sealer. This is Mod Podge. Cast and Craft has a brand. There are a couple of these. And I sprayed it, and that really brought up the shine. It definitely doesn't feel as nice as this one. The one that I sanded to 2000 grit and then buffed with the Flitz polish just feels lovely. And there's nothing on here except the resin that I cast, whereas this has the sealer on it. But it was a little bit quicker. So there you go, two different bracelets, both with special photos done in different molds with slightly different finishing techniques.